I'm Todd McKay. And I'm Franco Terrazano. And this is the Canadian Taxpayers Podcast. We're dedicated to lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. In our deep dive today, we're going to cover something that nobody else seemed to notice. Certainly governments didn't put out any press releases about it. But our Chris Sims, our BC director, she noticed some new numbers on BC's carbon tax. And she's going to come in and, and chat with us about that. And in Waste Watch, you know, it's one thing when you do something dumb. I think we've all done something dumb here and there. But the key is don't you keep doing the same dumb thing over and over and over again. We're going to talk about something like that in Waste Watch. But first, we've got a big court decision uh, that we're keeping an eye on. Franco, tell us about that. Well, you know, I got some bad news and I got some good news. And I'll start with the bad news. And the bad news is governments can stop you from buying life-saving medical treatment but the good news is, is that there's a team of lawyers at the Canadian Constitution Foundation that's fighting to change that. And they're challenging a law in British Columbia that effectively stops citizens from accessing timely care in independent clinics. But you know what? I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so here's what the Canadian Constitution Foundation's director of litigation and former CTFer Christine Van Gyne had to say about the case. So this is a really important case about healthcare choice in Canada. Uh, it was brought, brought by the Canby Surgical Centre, which is a, an independent non-government surgical centre, as well as four patients who want a simple question answered. And the question is, can the government prevent patients from paying for their own healthcare at independent non-government clinics if government hospitals are failing to perform medically necessary surgeries within the maximum acceptable wait times? And you know, that's a question that is applicable to the people of British Columbia just as well as it is applicable to people who are in other parts of the country who are having their access to health care restricted by provincial um, governments that have also limited access to private non-government clinics. Well, it's fun to hear from Christine Van Gyne again. She worked uh, for us as the Ontario director for a number of years, did a great job. Now she's over lawyering again with the Canadian Constitutional Foundation. But this whole situation reminds me of the 2005 Supreme Court case that struck down Quebec's ban on private health insurance. Uh, a really famous quote came out of that particular case, and it said, quote, access to a wait list is not access to health care. That's a really important point to keep in mind. Unfortunately, the decision in Quebec doesn't apply across Canada. So Franco, access to timely care is an important issue to all Canadians, but let's break down the taxpayer angle to this as well. Well, government health care has huge taxpayer implications because it's just so expensive, specifically when you're looking at the provincial level. You know, I'm in Alberta and our health care spending makes up about 40% of the budget. And if you take away labor costs, I mean, health care is really the big ticket item. And not just in Alberta, but Canada as a whole is a big spender when it comes to health care. So whether you're looking at our health spending as a percentage of the economy or our health spending on a per person basis, I mean, we're higher than, than many of our industrialized peers. And you know what's really frustrating about this isn't just that we're spending so much money. It's that we're spending all this money and we're not even getting the best results. And I want to read a quote from, uh, for you from a 2019 Fraser Institute study that compared Canada's healthcare system with OECD countries. And here's a quote, the high comparative spending on healthcare in Canada is not matched by equally strong performance. Specifically, Canada tends to rank in the middle to low end of performance across all four areas analyzed. You know, and it's interesting because allowing business to be involved in healthcare to bring some innovation and efficiency can improve outcomes. So I'm here in Saskatchewan. A few years ago, our provincial government moved some day surgeries to private clinics. Costs came way down. Wait times got way shorter. In fact, it was 26% cheaper to perform these procedures in these private clinics. And here's the thing that we find, it's funny in Canadian culture, the conversation about this. So much of it's defined by looking at the problems in the, uh, in the American context. And obviously there are problems with healthcare in America, but that's not the only other system that we can take a look at. When you look at almost any other uh, uh, major country, there's a blend of both private and public healthcare. 
Take a look at the list. Australia, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. All of them have both private and public elements to their healthcare systems. And I think you don't hear too many horror stories coming out of Switzerland or Sweden. Those are very good healthcare systems, and they've managed to blend together the benefits of both the public and the private system. Well, that's a really good point, Todd. And, you know, in Canada, uh, we definitely don't have the best healthcare system, and it's something that we should be working towards. And to do that, we've got to learn from other countries that are doing it better. Now, I want to read you another quote, this time from a family doctor in Vancouver, Dr. Will Johnston. And here's what he had to say, quote, Our peer nations like Britain, France, and Australia have a sensible mix of public and private services that deliver timely care. Here in Canada, we are shackled to a clogged system. Access to everything from psychiatry to scans to surgery is just plain bad. People get hurt waiting. Yeah, there's a human cost to this as well as a taxpayer cost. All of that's important to keep in mind. But you mentioned the Canadian Constitution Foundation is challenging the law in BC. Bring us up to date on the status of that particular case. Well, unfortunately, the BC Supreme Court ruled against easing restrictions for patients seeking treatments outside of the government system. Uh, here's what Christine had to say about the decision. The result was that the judge found, the trial level judge found that these prohibitions that prevent patients from using non-government clinics, private clinics, those prohibitions are a violation of patients' Section 7 right to security of person. Uh, when combined with really bad wait times, he found that patients' health can deteriorate while on a wait list. However, the judge found that even though there was a right violation, a rights violation, that patients could be harmed, he found that that violation remains consistent with the principles of fundamental justice. So it looks like the Canadian Constitution Foundation lost the case in BC, but it seems like a pretty good bet that there will be a challenge to the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm going to roll another clip for you here from Christine. So our next step is that we, we are going to be seeking an appeal in this case. So um, there's still some time, uh, but we will be seeking an appeal. And I will point out that in Shaiuli, um, the case was lost at the lower levels and ultimately it won at the Supreme Court. So we're not deterred by this decision at the trial level. Um, it's just one, one step forward in preserving patient rights in Canada. So we're excited about the appeal and we're looking forward to it. Listen, this is a really important case. We're going to keep on top of it and uh, bring you updates as it moves along. We're also going to include a link in the show notes so you can learn more about it. But now we've got to jump to another important issue. There was a big update on the performance of the carbon tax in BC. Premier John Horgan didn't put out a press release about it. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he didn't put out a press release. In fact, even most of the media didn't notice it, but our own Chris Sims, our BC director, she was all over it. I'm going to talk to her next and I'll give you the update. It's time for a deep dive into important issues. And we've got Chris Sims back here. She's been off the podcast for a few weeks because she's been crunching a ton of numbers about BC's carbon tax. What did you figure out there, Simmer? Short answer is, Todd, it's not working. Uh, emissions are going up here in British Columbia, even though we have the highest carbon tax in all of Canada and all the politicians said, hey, it's going to make emissions go down. Eh, it's not working. They've actually gone up 10% in the past three years. They've gone up in five of the last seven years. And this is government documents. This is their own numbers. Yeah, that's a remarkable aspect of this. Usually... Governments, they, they put out press releases, like, ah, look at these new numbers. <laughs> these ones are just getting updated on some obscure website that clearly nobody looks at it except for you, Chris Sims. I'm pretty sure you're the only one who clicks those links. But let's take a step back here. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he loves to point at BC and say, hey, look at that. The carbon tax is working great there. Let's do it everywhere else in the country. What do you actually say to that? What are we doing? Well, we're doing this, unfortunately, because some people want to be the popular kid in school. And in all seriousness, uh, carbon taxes were super popular out here when they first started. In 2008, then California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger even thought they were awesome. He flew up to Ottawa to try to sell it to Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And our premier here in BC, Gordon Campbell, he jumped on the bandwagon. But you know what? 
uh, the evidence shows that it's not actually working. When they first put it in here, they promised that it would be revenue neutral, that it would stop at $30 a ton, that it would create a whole bunch of alternative energies that we could pick from instead of oil and gas. And most importantly, they said it would cause emissions to go down. Today, none of that is true. Yeah, it's interesting when political claims come up against the common sense of the common people. You look in Alberta, previous government brought in a carbon tax, new government promises to get rid of it. Now it's gone there. Ontario, same thing, hugely expensive cap and trade carbon tax, new government promises we're going to get rid of it, gets elected with a big mandate. Obviously, the feds have still imposed it in Alberta and Ontario. But what are we, what are we doing here? How come this is still a problem? I think it comes down to the great divide between what sounds good in theory and what actually doesn't work on the street. So unfortunately, many academics and policy wonks uh, in capital cities still think that on paper, pricing carbon, as they put it, or a carbon tax is a good thing. And they can show you all sorts of charts and graphs that say it's a good thing. But the reality is it's not because one, emissions are still going up. And two, it costs average people a ton of money every year. And you know what's really sad is that even... Our premier, John Horgan, last year here in British Columbia, when he spiked the carbon tax up, when he increased it, and some people complained, including yours truly, he said, oh, well, it's just a few pennies a liter. You know what? Putting it that way is really dismissive. Everybody I know notices the price of gas. And what's really sad is that John Horgan, when he was in opposition, he used to fight the good fight. He opposed the carbon tax. He said it was going to cost families too much to drive their cars and heat their homes. Here, listen to him here. And tell, tell people back in my constituency to get a pair of running shoes, buy some compact fluorescents, and get some weather stripping. Well, when the carbon tax kicks in, what, three years from now, it'll be seven cents a liter. What do you think, Honorable Speaker, the cost of uh, home heating fuel is going to be at that time? How are people in northern parts of British Columbia, people in, uh, on the wild west coast where the winds blow and the, uh, and the uh, temperatures drop, what's the cost going to be to those people? Are they going to be able to catch a bus to, to come to uh, Victoria to buy some weather stripping? No, they're not. They're going to have to get in their car and pay for that as well. So that was Premier John Horgan back in the day when he was in opposition. You know, it's funny how politicians in opposition talk about how they want to save taxpayers money. And then politicians, when they're in government, suddenly spending that money seems like a lot more fun. Pretty frustrating. But Chris Sims, you're saying that this isn't about pennies. This is real money. Tell us about that. It is serious money. So technically, it is set at $40 uh, a ton. In human speak, that puts an extra 8.9 cents per liter to your cost of gasoline and more than 10 cents per liter for diesel at the fuel pumps here in BC. And that really adds up. I sat there and did the math on the fuel capacity of various vehicles. If you drive a minivan or one of those bigger sedans, the BC carbon tax costs you an extra six bucks every single time you fill up your tank. And it's just in the carbon tax, no extra taxes with that. Regular size pickup truck, and I mean a small one, like the 1500 series, that costs an extra $10 extra in the carbon tax just to fill up. And if you're a two vehicle commuter family, which many of us are here in the Fraser Valley, for example, that adds up fast. Oh man, and you bring it to a farm in Saskatchewan, it adds up really fast. Try taking a load of grain down the highway to the elevator that can get really expensive. Try uh, running the grain dryer, which you have to do in order to make your crop marketable if it's uh, got a little extra moisture in it. That's a ton of money in a big hurry. Exactly. And here in BC, a huge percentage of people use natural gas as their sole source of heating for their homes. In fact, here you go with government interference. Years ago, they used to push it. The government of BC used to say, hey, switch over to natural gas because it's the clean blue flame. Well, nowadays, fast forward, people are sending us their bills, Todd, and quite often the carbon tax on their natural gas bill for their home is more than the fuel they're using. Okay, but let me play my uh, normal role as a devil's advocate here. Proponents of the carbon tax, the economists, Prime Minister Trudeau, a lot of those folks like to say, ah, don't worry about it. 
yeah, it'll cost you a little extra money to pay the carbon tax at the pump, but don't worry. There's going to be rebates. Great rebates. You're going to get all this money back. It's great. Why are you, why are you raining all over that parade there, Chris? <laughs> First off, I just got to say it defies common sense to say that if you give the government $10 out of your wallet and it filters through various levels of bureaucracies, that you'll magically get more money back out of it. That doesn't make any sense. You literally have to pay for the processing of the payment. But when you get right down to it, this actually doesn't apply to average working class families. Here in BC, it's called the BC Climate Action Rebate. And it only helps those who are very, very low income. And usually those folks are already uh, dependent on transit and they're not using their vehicles in the same way that a two-person working family would. So to give you the real numbers, a family of four here in BC who earn less than $41,000 a year, they get a maximum rebate of about 450 bucks a year. Okay. But once that family earns more than $41,000, that rebate drops by 2% of their income over that amount. That means by the time our working family is making around $64,000 or so, the rebate evaporates. Newsflash, the average median income of BC families is $80,000. Cost of living here in BC, especially in the lower mainland, places like Vancouver and the Fraser Valley, very high. So this rebate does nothing for those average families. Yeah, that whole uh, concept of revenue neutrality, that's a myth. If you buy into that, I've got some magic beans uh, for sale. Just give me a call. <laughs> uh, listen, Chris, it's a good thing that you were looking into this stuff. I just did a, a quick Google search to see what other media were covering the fact that BC's carbon emissions were going up. It's pretty much you. You wrote a, uh, a newspaper column, Sunshine ran it across the country. You're the one who blew the whistle on it. We're not seeing it anywhere else. And it's really important that, uh, that we're keeping an eye on this because the, the bottom line is the carbon tax is costing people an awful lot of money, but it's not helping the environment. Hey, one more thing before we move off of this topic. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is at the Supreme Court this week, right now, fighting the carbon tax. There are dozens of special interest groups there arguing in favor of the carbon tax. We've got the David Suzuki Foundation, lots of others, dozens of them pushing for a carbon tax. There's only one non-government organization fighting against the carbon tax at the Supreme Court. That's the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We're going to have an update for you on that in coming weeks. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Sorry for interrupting the podcast, but I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to tell you more about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. We are 235,000 Canadians from coast to coast that are fed up. We are fed up with politicians taking too much out of our paychecks, often to waste it on a bunch of pet projects, corporate welfare, and pork barreling to buy votes. We organize campaigns to push back on these politicians. These campaigns often include petition drives, billboards, media stunts, and more. But most importantly, they ask our supporters to pitch in and take action. Alone, we're a voice in the wilderness. Together, we're an army to be reckoned with. You can join the fight and sign up at no cost at taxpayer.com. That website again is taxpayer.com. Okay, now back to the podcast. It is time for Waste Watch. This is the part of the show where we make fun of politicians for wasting taxpayers' money on stupid, stupid things. Franco, you've got an update on a story that never seems to end, and it costs taxpayers billions. What have you got today? Well, Todd, remember when former Alberta Premier Ralph Klein said that the one saving grace is that we were probably all stupid together? Yeah, you know, old Ralph Klein... Say what you will about him, but he was a gold mine for classic quotes. In this case, he was talking about how taxpayers got burned when the Alberta and Saskatchewan governments uh, teamed up with the feds and poured millions of dollars into the refining business uh, in Lloyd Minster, right on the border between Saskatchewan and Alberta. Alberta taxpayers got burned for hundreds of millions of dollars. But why are you bringing up this old Ralph Klein quote? Well, shocker, shocker, shocker. Uh, we're learning again that taxpayers are getting burned for corporate welfare and specifically getting burned again 
on the Sturgeon Refinery. Uh, the Energy Department's new annual report is showing big losses for the uh, for one of their crown corporations, mainly because of this Sturgeon Refinery. Yeah, you'd think after they built the refinery in Lloyd Minster, they would have said, you know what, maybe the refinery business, it's not the right business for government to be in. But then years later, they get into the refinery business again with the Sturgeon Refinery. This boondoggle just keeps on going, Franco. Why is this coming up again? Well, here, let me break down what's going on. And, you know, it was a pretty complex deal, but uh, here's some of the high-level details. So the progressive conservatives initially got us into this mess. They pushed taxpayers into the refining business. And, you know, what's been going on is there's been massive increases in construction costs. The government loaned out uh, way too much money to the refinery. And uh, now, because of all these issues, it's led to a $7 billion increase in the expected cost to taxpayers, a 7 billion dollar increase yeah and former finance minister ted morton he's taken a look at this and here's the quote he's given on it it's almost impossible to break even that's not good when you're looking at multi-billion dollar investments there are way too many examples of politicians getting into the business of business and burning taxpayers you know with all of these failures what do you think is going through a politician's mind when these uh, huge investments in corporate welfare go blowing out the door. You know, I got my own ideas of what they might be thinking, but let's ask someone who's actually been there, who's been in office. Let's see what uh, the former finance and energy minister, Ted Morton, has to say about it. And quote, you take a lot more risk when you're gambling with other people's money than with your own. And let's face it, for politicians, I don't care what party, you're not playing with your own money. Yeah, that's a sad reality. And that's why we have to keep reminding them you're not playing with your own money. But there's somebody in office in Alberta who shouldn't need reminding on that front. Yeah, Todd, I know who you're talking about. You're, of course, talking about Premier Jason Kenney, who was once with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Um, Now, to be fair, you know, Sturgeon Refinery, that's not on Kenney. Um, But... Kenny has been dishing out a ton of taxpayer cash lately on new corporate welfare. And that's disappointing because if there is any politician out there who knows the dangers of corporate welfare, it should be Premier Kenny. You know, back in the 90s, when he was with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, he was leading the charge against corporate welfare in Alberta. And, you know, the CTF under Kenny was publishing reports about how business boondoggles were costing us billions. And, you know, in the 90s, Kenny even launched a successful campaign that pushed then-Premier Ralph Klein to limit corporate welfare in Alberta. And it wasn't just back in the 90s that uh, Kenny was railing against corporate welfare. You know, here's what Kenny said uh, only a few years ago. I would get the Alberta government out of the business of business, out of the losing business of picking winners and losers. This is something I have experience with. You may recall back in the late 80s, the Getty government had a failed effort to diversify Alberta's economy by putting your tax dollars at risk with loans, grants, and loan guarantees. And we ended up owning a magnesium plant, a cell phone company, Peter Pocklington's meatpacking plant, a tire recycling facility. They all went down as government interventions in the economy tend to do. Because when politicians are risking your money instead of their own, you might as well send them to the casino. I mean, they have no incentive to get it right. And, and uh, so I uh, called on that. We lost $9 billion dollars between 1986 and 1992 as a result of those bad government so-called investments. So I, uh, as head of the Taxpayers Association, launched a campaign for what I called, quotes, no more boondoggles legislation to ban corporate welfare. And uh, Ralph Klein's government actually put that into law. Regret- regrettably, it's basically been undone. And now we see government creeping back into um, uh, you know, and our efforts to pick winners and losers. And it means the taxpayer almost always loses. So I would bring back legislation to keep the government out of the market. What we need is the right overall economic conditions. Low taxes, a low regulatory regime, affordable power prices, reasonable labor costs, um, and, and, and a government that has a pro-investment uh, attitude, uh, as opposed to uh, politicians picking winners and losers. So that clip was from Jason Kenney before he was premier talking about how corporate welfare, bad deal for taxpayers. 
But this problem never ends. This is why the Canadian Taxpayers Federation has to be here to keep an eye on this stuff. And this is not just an Alberta problem. It's a big problem in Alberta. But boy, we've seen these problems on the national stage as well. The Trudeau government strategic innovation fund, it's cost taxpayers more than a billion dollars since 2017. It's created about 6,600 jobs, but that's about $160,000 per job. And we're hearing that there's way more corporate welfare in the pipeline right now. So we've got a big job on our hands trying to keep an eye on all of this. Well, that's right. I mean, taxpayers, we don't need corporate welfare. The last thing we need are a bunch of bureaucrats and politicians, whether that's in Edmonton or in Ottawa, you know, running around trying to play investment banker with our money. So that's why we need to put an end to this. We got to really hit politicians hard when they start spending our money on business ventures. So go to taxpayer.com, sign our petition. We'll also include that link in the show notes. And we have another link for you, a report by Ted Morton on the Sturgeon Refinery if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into those details. And of course, you can find those in the show notes as well. All right, that is it for today. Thank you so much to James Wood for editing the podcast and putting it together for us. Yeah, thanks, Jimbo. You're really making us sound much better than we do on these uh, on these rough cuts. But most importantly, thank you out there for listening. And, you know, before you hit end, please like, subscribe, and share because it really helps us get the message out to more Canadian taxpayers. Hi, I'm Scott Hennig, President of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. If you've got another minute, I'd like to ask you to think about the one person you know that would really enjoy listening to this podcast. Do us a favor and do them a favor and send them a quick note to let them know about it. At the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, we believe there is power in numbers. That's why we've worked so hard to build an army of taxpayers who are ready to push back. And we did it because people like you shared our work with that one person that they knew would really appreciate taking part. Thanks for listening, and thanks for doing your part to make Canada a better place.